Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of March 9th, 2020. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael on Tuesdays from 6.20 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify pages, also on the new Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as on the projects page on national blog site medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues all are tied to this week's oil price collapse. First, the last time oil prices dropped, we had $17 billion in fiscal reserves. This time, we have nothing. What will be the impact? Second, two national think tanks weigh in with proposals on how to raise Alaska revenue, what they are saying. And third, we take our first pass at the potential effects of the oil price dive on the Alaska oil patch. And now, let's join Michael. Uh, interesting weekend, to say the least, between the uh, oil pricing war that broke out between OPEC and Russia, the coronavirus fears cratering the markets, and of course, the long-term effects of that still unknown how much, you know, what kind of ripple effect that that's going to have. Uh, it is uh, just this perfect storm of crisis that's in the making. Last time, we had uh, about $17 billion in reserves sitting in the savings account. Today, we got nothing. Let's Let's talk about that. Yeah, that's that's exactly the right the right thing to focus on. Uh, we Alaska has been through this before. We went through this in 2014 uh, when oil prices crashed, and we had to sort of start dealing with with our fiscal issues. We didn't deal with them. We haven't dealt with them very well at all. But but underpinning us throughout this entire uh, period was was the constitutional budget reserve and the statutory budget reserve. We started out with a Five billion, uh, a little over five billion dollars in a statutory budget reserve that we had, that we had put aside uh, in previous years, and so as we as we dealt with the crash, the oil price crash, uh, we were uh, uh, supported uh, by by this huge. For the intervening six years, you would think we would have said, "Okay, well, we understand this is how we survived last time, and and we need to we need to position ourselves to be able to do that again in, in case things uh, things happen again." Uh, but we didn't, and now we now we're hitting this uh, uh, step down in oil prices, um, and I'm and I'm concerned this step down is 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 going to be significant uh, and as significant as the last one in terms of sort of resetting the base uh, oil price. Um, and we've hit this one and we have no fiscal reserves. Uh, we've, we've gone through the $5 billion that we had in the SBR. We've borrowed uh, more than $12 billion from the constitutional budget reserve. That constitutional budget reserve is down to less than $2 billion now. Um, and we and we really just have nothing in the tank uh, to be able to support us this time through. So this time is going to be different uh, than than what we than what we faced in 2014. We we just have we have no cushion uh, that's going to that's going that we can land on uh, and hold our and hold ourselves up as we sort of glide to, to something else. Uh, we're going to hit and 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 we're going to hit hard. And and the consequence of that. Uh, is going to be significant. I mean, we're going to end up with taxes of some sort. We've already had taxes for the last four years in terms of PFD cuts, taking the income from middle and lower income Alaska families in order to support, support state government. Um, and now we're going to have we're going to we're going to have some form of taxes continuing going forward. They're going to be deeper, 
And the question, I think the question that we're going to have to confront is what kind of tax structure are we going to have? Are we going to continue to, have, to use uh, PFD cuts as our tax structure, continue to take more and more from middle and lower income Alaska families until, until there's nothing from the PFD left? Uh, or are we going to have a broader based uh, uh, tax going forward? But but we're not we're not going to have we're not going to have the same sort of glide path that we had uh, from 2014 to, to present. We've used up all of that cushion, uh, and uh, and we're going to hit hard. One of the interesting uh, uh, points that I think is made, I think Suzanne Downing made it this morning, talking about it, is that uh, you know that even if we have um, you know, even if we have taxes, that um, that those taxes may not be enough, or they would have to be such so significant as to actually damage the economy themselves uh, to try and offset this kind of loss. I mean, if we talk about a long term loss, and one of the uh, I think it was the Washington, uh, I think it was the Wall Street Journal that was talking about um, some of the analysts were saying the last time OPEC and and Russia had a uh, oil price war it took 2 years for the markets to restabilize um even if they you know even if they come to the table uh in the short term or in the long term uh i mean this this the uh, governor dunleavy kind of sh- you know shrugged it off like this is just a short term problem but uh i think if it if it does last one or two years there may not be enough revenue uh you know generated even with a tax without damaging the economy as a whole what do you think oh i We've already damaged the economy. I mean, that's that's let, let's not let's not slight what's happened since 2016 with uh, with uh, the the income tax with the PFD taxes. Uh, we've already damaged the economy. We've already taken money out of the Alaska economy uh, in, uh, in in some significant sig- significant levels, and I think uh, and I think we have seen uh, some damage as a result of that. So yes, we've seen damage, and 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 what I think. The best interpretation of Suzanne is we're going to see even more damage uh, as a result of it, and 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 damage that um, uh, goes deeper uh, if we continue to focus it on on PFD cuts, continue to take that tax out of PFD cuts, uh, goes deeper on middle and lower income Alaska families. Let's talk about let's talk about the oil price for a second uh, because uh, I, I want to make sure people sort of start getting in their minds where I think we're headed. Uh, 2014, yeah, it, we came out of it in two years, but we came out of it substantially changed from where we went in. When we went into the oil price dro- uh, drop of 2014, we went in with about $100 uh, oil. We came out of that after two years with about $60 oil uh, or $70 oil. Um, and and that was that's a substantial structural change. Uh, that we've been that we've been dealing with uh, uh, ever since. Uh, when we come out, if we come out of this, when we come out of this this current battle, I think we're going to see the same sort of structural change. Part of what's going on here, and it's not been picked up widely in the press, but when you talk to industry analysts, they're they're seeing it. Part of what's going on here is Saudi has sort of looked at its whole card and said, "Hey." We're, we're, we may be approaching a peak oil demand era, um, and there may be a decline in oil demand. And, and you've seen a lot of analysts talk about uh, the potential of stranded assets, stranded oil assets, uh, at, at sort of the, the as we get into the 2040s and 2050s. Um, Saudi doesn't want to be the holder of, of those stranded oil assets when we when we get to the when we get to the end of that there's there's going to be if we have stranded oil assets there's you, you may have oil in the ground sort of like coal is now you may have oil in the ground you may have a lot of oil in the ground but it may not be worth much and so selling it now monetizing it now even if for a, a lower price um, is 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 better for their overall fiscal picture than continuing to up to, to support a high price, limit limit production, support a high price, but end up being the holder of a big chunk of these stranded assets uh, w- once we get into the 2040s and 2050s. So I think part of what we're seeing Saudi do is say, look, we're going to monetize. Uh, we're going to monetize our oil. And yes, we realize that in order to monetize our oil, uh, we've got uh, we're going to have to accept a lower price. Uh, but now that we've sort of pushed into this mode, 
uh, that's what we're going to do. And and some analysts are looking at Saudi and say, you know, they're still getting the same level of revenues. They're 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 increasing production um, uh, to offset the lower price that they're getting, and the and the and the stream of revenues that are going into Saudi are still are still roughly the same. And from Saudi's standpoint, they're saying, yeah, I mean, so so we're getting the revenues we need. Yes, we're we're pumping more oil to do that, but this is oil that otherwise is going to sit there stranded at the end of uh, at the end of uh, 2040 and, and 2050. And so what's what's wrong with monetizing that oil now while we still have it, as opposed to, you know, getting higher revenues, but on on lower volumes. So I, I think I think we're, we're moving toward a period where we're resetting the base, the oil price base again. Uh, we reset it from a hundred dollars uh, before we went into the 2014 plunge down to the 60 or 70 where we've been. Now we're going into this plunge that looks a lot like 2014, uh, and we may end up with a base that looks a lot different. may may look like a 40 to 50 dollar base uh, going forward. Uh, as opposed to the sixty to seventy dollar base uh, base we've had, so the, the, yes, there, there, there's sort of two problems then, right? There, there's the problem of of going through this price war uh, and and it taking a period of time to get through this price war, and that's a problem because we don't have the the CBR and the SBR as a financial cushion to get through this transition period. But at the end of the transition period, we may also be seeing a different base. Uh, uh, oil price uh, out there uh, than 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 what we've come off of, and that's a that's a huge problem for Alaska, frankly, uh, because a lot of our oil investments, a lot of the a lot of the cost structure uh, that we have uh, around Alaska development, uh, sort of works at, at sixty dollars, uh, isn't isn't going to work as well uh, at uh, at forty to fifty dollars. Brad Keithley is our guest, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We've been talking about the last time this happened. We had some uh, fiscal cushion and reserve. Now we don't. We're looking at the long term. Brad just touched on the long term of the reset of oil prices. Uh, Brad, let's finish up with number one here. Seventeen billion in reserves last time. This time, almost nothing. Especially if we're going to keep any kind of liquidity or or shock absorber in the system to be able to do it. Uh, final thoughts on number one. Well. We're going to taxes, and we'll talk a little bit about more about this in segment two, but we're going to taxes. And the question now has to be that, that Alaskans need to confront is what kind of tax structure, long-term tax structure, do we want? Are, are, as a state, are we going to accept long-term, deep, deep, deep PFD cuts as our tax structure falling largely on, on middle- and lower-income Alaska families? Or are we going to have a discussion and, and develop a broader-based approach uh, that, uh, that, that involves more people in contributing to, uh, to uh, the, Alaska, uh, the cost of Alaska government? Yeah, I don't know, Brad, and I don't know if you want to get into this on the other side, but, I mean, I, I said it yesterday. I think uh, Ben Carpenter said it last week uh, that, you know, again, there's just not – this was before the whole price war and everything else broke out. Um, is that we are looking at maybe the last year or maybe two of getting any kind of PFD, and it will be basically subsumed by the legislature through fiat. I mean, they, they're basically going to make that decision for us. I mean, that's what I was saying. I was laughing when you said it's it's cute that you think we have a choice because I think that they're already making that decision. You can look at some of the commentary that's being reported in the newspapers, uh, you know, with uh, – with uh, Von Imhoff and Giesel and Stedman all kind of saying, well, you know, well, I had to laugh when it said Von Imhoff said that we're going to be fiscally conservative. We're going to take the, <laughs> we're going to be taking a fiscally conservative approach, uh, which would yeah. be like, well, that'd be a start. I mean, that'd be the first time ever you've done that. Yeah, it's it's one. I've read that also, and it's one of those one of those things where you go after spitting out my coffee when I read it. I was, right, I was so shocked, shocked when she said that. It's one of those things where you go, I don't think those words mean what you think they mean. Right, you're you're, you're taking words um, like some some people sometimes accuse the president of. Right, you're you're taking these words that you want to be your that you think. You know, people will react well to, but you're applying it to something entirely different than uh, than than what the what what you're doing, what the what the current situation is is doing. I mean, it's not fiscally conservative to to use deeply regressive 
taxes. You are hurt with deeply regressive taxes, especially the PFD, which are, which are not which are taxes that are not levied on non-residents. You're not bringing in new money into the state. You're not having non-residents pay a portion of the cost of government. You're you're putting the entire burden of the cost of government on Alaskans only. Um, and, and then you're putting it on middle and lower income Alaska families, uh, deeply regressive, like the taxes like that hurt the economy. I mean, it's not, it's not simply that they hurt those families, which they do, but they hurt the overall economy because you're not bringing in new money. Uh, you're not bringing in outside money to help support state government. You're not reducing the burden you're putting on, on your own people in the state, like almost every other state does. I mean, sales taxes and, and income taxes in other states, a portion of, of, of non-residents, non-residents pay a portion of the burden of those costs. The people of the state, resident in the state, don't have to pay the entire cost. The way we're doing it with the PFD, uh, uh, taxing through the PFD, Alaska, only Alaskans are paying for the cost uh, of state government. Non-residents that, that, you, that benefit from Alaska and benefit from Alaska state government aren't paying a dime towards right. the cost of government. And then when you put it on lower middle income, lower middle income Alaska families who, who, who spend almost everything they get uh, in terms of income, spend and put it back into the economy in one way uh, or another, as opposed to the upper incomes, which put a lot of their money into savings or investments or, or, or spend it out of state, when you when you when you focus your tax burden on middle and lower income Alaska families, you're taking a lot more money out of the economy than you would if you spread the burden uh, broadly across all Alaskans and and, and included non residents. So it's not fiscally conservative <laughs> to 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 be focusing to to be raising revenue through PFD taxes. It's the exact reverse of that. Right. It is. Um, it, it is. It is. Uh, uh, crony capitalist in a way because you're protecting the top 20 percent uh, and you're focusing the burden entirely on lower and middle income Alaska families and hurting the economy um, in the process. The top 20 percent is fine. They're, they're, they're not feeling any pain. They're saying, yeah, we can survive this. Well, hell, they're not paying anything toward it. Right. Uh, it's, it's, the, it's the middle and lower income Alaska families uh, and the Alaska economy that's suffering as a result of that. So to claim that's fiscally conservative is just, as, as I said, it's just using words that you think will appeal to people, <coughs> but, <coughs> excuse me, but it's not actually what you're doing. You're doing it something entirely different. Uh, Michael says, so Brad, when we go to more taxes, what stops the legislature from frivolously spending and raising taxes each year to launder the overspending? I mean, obviously, so far there's no entity to hold them to law. You got about sixty seconds. Well, we we I mean we we do that right now. I mean, PFT cuts are getting deeper and deeper and deeper each year. They're 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 continuing to take to tax more and more and more through PFT cuts. Frankly, I think if we went to a broad based tax, a flat tax that that affected the top twenty percent, caused them to have to pay taxes, they would suddenly focus on state spending and we would find we would find constraints on state spending we're not now right now the top 20 percent say we don't care continue state spending as long as you don't tax us you can spend all you want that's essentially what the house majority is if you tax the top 20 percent in the same fashion you're taxing everybody else the top 20 percent will wake up and say wait we don't want to pay taxes stop this spending right so you want to you want to control spending start taxing everybody number two Two national think tanks have proposals for Alaska that, uh, you know, propose doing something about this. But it seems like both of them uh, are pushing the cost from one side of the plate to the other while avoiding it for for, for some groups out there. Uh, and I think that's just what I'm talking about here. They've already decided what kind of what kind of choice, what kind of taxes they're going to make. Uh, give us a tease here before we go to break. Well, there. So so we're getting we're now picking up a lot of interest from. Uh, sort of DC think tanks about tax structure. Um, we have one from the Tax Foundation uh, that uh, uh, has has been developed as sort of the c- more conservative approach. We have one from uh, ITF, the Institute of Taxation and Economic Policy, that is uh, more progressive, um, and w- and we'll talk about those two. 
one characteristic of both of them is they broaden the tax base. They, they both say we shouldn't be focusing the tax base merely on middle and lower income Alaska families. We ought to be broadening the tax base uh, that, would, that would lessen the burden on everybody by broadening the base. Uh, but then you get into a question about how do you broaden that base and, and who gets hit. And they have, they have different views, and we need to be talking about those views. We tease number two, which is these two possibilities. Two national think tanks have come out with proposals. Both of them push the costs to one group while avoiding another. Uh, neither is necessarily ideal. Brad, what, uh, what see you here on this? So there's two, there's two tax proposals that have been put out, but specifically focused on Alaska, put out uh, by these national think tanks. One is the Tax Foundation, which I think did theirs, has, has developed theirs in conjunction with the Alaska Policy Forum. Um, we've talked about it on the show before. Basically, it's a sales tax-based approach. The other is uh, the Institute of Taxation and, Econo- of Taxation and Economic Policy, another D.C. think tank. Both of these are respected D.C. think tanks. ITEP comes at things with a, a, a little bit more progressive uh, view, and ITEP's proposal basically is a progressive income tax, um, uh, a way of sort of mimicking the federal uh, tax approach, uh, income tax approach, uh, and applying it to Alaska. Here's the benefit of both of them. Uh, there is a benefit to both. Both of them are broad-based, both are, are broader based than PFD cuts. Um, so uh, they both are spreading the burden, uh, e- either a sales tax or a progressive income tax would spread the burden uh, beyond just Alaskans. It would bring in Part of the contribution to government, cost of government, would come from outside, uh, either through sales tax that would pick up tourists, uh, or through in- income tax, which would pick up, pick up non-resident uh, non-residents working in the state, um, and would and would broaden the tax base, lessen the burden on on uh, on on just on Alaskans, which is what we're doing through PFD taxes, and it would it would spread the burden beyond middle and lower income Alaska families. So both of them are recognizing. I think that the way we're doing it now through PFD cuts is the worst way to do it, uh, and that there is a better, there are better ways to do it than PFD cuts. And frankly, if somebody said at the end of the day, you could, you're either going to face sales taxes uh, or a progressive income tax, you, you get one of those instead of the PFD. I would pick one of those because at least they're broader, and at least they're 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 bringing in some contribution. To costs from outsiders, but here's the pro- here's the problem: sales taxes essentially are another form of regressive taxes. They're not as regressive as as PFD cuts, but they but they do shift the burden toward middle and lower income uh, families. The way they do that through sales taxes is a sales tax essentially excludes savings and investment. The portion of of income that goes to savings and investment are not taxed. Uh, under a sales tax, only the portion of income that goes to consumption is taxed under a sales tax. And when you look at income brackets, who saves and invests uh, and thus gets an exclusion from taxes on that portion of their income, it's the top 20%. Middle and lower income Alaska families tend to have very low savings, and they tend to have very high. They they use a, a, the largest uh, a large share of their income. Uh, for consumption. So they end up paying the burden of the tax. Um, and so sales tax is really a regressive tax. Uh, income taxes, the, the, the form of income taxes being proposed by ITEP, progressive income taxes, shift the burden to the to upper income classes. They, they, a progressive income tax, as everybody knows from federal income taxes, charges you higher percentage rates the farther up the income bracket you are. The effect of that is to is to gather most of the money or collect most of the money out of the top income brackets. Uh, the lower income brackets uh, pay virtually nothing toward uh, toward the cost of government. So it sort of goes in the other extreme. It shifts the burden over to the top income brackets and the lower income brackets, um, uh, lower middle and the lowest income brackets uh, uh, pay virtually nothing. The middle income bracket pays uh, a fairly a fairly low percentage under progressive income taxes. So sales taxes are shoving it um, largely onto the backs of lower and middle income Alaska families. Progressive income taxes are shoving it largely onto upper income uh, families. And as I was talking about 
before we went to the break. The problem with that is if you let somebody get government for free, uh, just as we're doing with PFD taxes, the top 20% really aren't paying any taxes. If you let somebody get government for free, they don't have any incentive to control spending. Their, their response is, I'm not going to use political capital to control spending because I don't have to pay for it. Uh, you know, I, I, why would I want to stop spending? I get all these free goods out there. I get a univer- I get three universities. I get all this sort of activity out there, and I don't have to pay for it. So why do I want to stop spending? When you, when you set up a tax system that allows somebody to escape being taxed, somebody to pay for contributing toward the cost of government, you're going to have a spending problem. Right, because at one at one segment or another, somebody's going to keep pushing for spending as long as they don't have to pay for it. Well, and I think this is a good. I mean, it's a good point. It's well taken. I think it's a good idea. But as Michael in the chat room says, I mean, we could all be for taxing the top twenty percent, but the top twenty, which is what the legislators primarily made of, I mean, like ninety percent of them are all in the top twenty percent or higher income bracket, will never allow it to pass into law as of right now. I mean, do you see anything changing? I, <laughs> I politically, uh, I have hopes uh, that that legislators will uh, be uh, uh, more focused on the overall Alaska economy. I mean, what we're doing is we're hurting the overall Alaska economy through the current PFD taxes, um, and so if we're going into another recession, uh, as we may be in this state, why do you want to be taking steps that hurt the Alaska economy even more? Why don't you want to be pursuing tax structures that that at least are neutral against the Alaska economy, if not supportive of the Alaska economy? Um, and that discussion, when I have that with legislators, that appeals uh, uh, to, to some of them. Um, I think I, I think yeah, it's it's fighting uphill, but that's the point that that people really don't have a rebuttal to. It's it, you know when you talk about one class or another, they go yeah well. But but they shouldn't, but they do. But when you say, but you're hurting the overall Alaska economy in the, in, in the approach you're taking, why do you want to do that when we're going into a recession? Uh, they don't have a good response to that. So uh, that's the, that, I, I think we have legislators down there uh, that, that are concerned about the overall Alaska economy, do understand that different fiscal approaches affect the economy differently, do understand that we're taking all of the money for government now out of Alaska hands, out of the Alaska economy, as opposed to getting a contribution of a portion of it from outside, uh, either through sales taxes or income taxes. Um, and I think are, are going through the process of thinking about the impact on the Alaska economy. I have hopes that we have, <laughs> that we have some realization of that, but yeah. you're going to tell me I'm naive. But well, they, it's all hopes. You know, it's all you, hopes and dreams you, at this point. Right. You've got you've got to try though, right? I right. mean, you've got you've got to. I mean, these are facts. These are facts. We are hurting the Alaska economy. That's a fact. Right. We're going in. We're going into another recession. That's a fact. Why do you want to be hurting the Alaska economy even worse uh, when we're going into a recession? I know it helps your group. I know your income group is all is all fat, dumb, and happy over here. But why do you want to, as a legislator? Why do you want to be hurting the Alaska economy? Yeah. Um, and. It, 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 I, if you if you don't have a good response to that point, you ought to be rethinking your position. Yep, absolutely. Tuckerman asks in the in the chat room, how much will the sales tax and income tax collect? We're spending two billion dollars plus a year in deficit. Can we collect all that two billion dollars back in deficit without? I mean, we're already damaging the economy. Would that seems like that would be almost a, 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 a an increase or a gutting of the economy at that point? Trying to capture that two billion dollars plus in deficit. Well, we're already, I mean, we're already cutting the PFD uh, by a huge amount. We're already damaging the economy in the worst possible way through the regressive approach of, of taxes. So uh, we, we've already said we can, that Alaska can absorb that. Uh, so just, just taking the PFD taxes that we have now and spreading them more broadly actually would, would, would benefit the Alaska economy because we'd be starting to get a portion of it paid by outsiders uh, and we would be spreading the impact more broadly across across all Alaskans, as opposed to just focusing on lower income, lower and uh, or middle and, and lower income Alaska families. Uh, there is an upper upper limit um, to, to how much tax we can pay, uh, but we're not going to find that upper limit, frankly, uh, as long as we have a group like the top twenty percent that don't have to pay it. And so that would mean the upper limit is really just the full PFD. 
because they don't they're not going to care if the full PFD goes away. The upper limit's going to be set when Alaskans, all Alaskans, push back and say, "No, we're paying enough now. Thank you very much. Uh, we don't want any more government services. Uh, we want government services to to we, we don't want we don't want to continue to grow government services because we don't want to pay for them. Um, uh, we have all the government that we're willing to willing to pay for. That's not going to occur. We're not going to find that upper limit until all Alaskans have to pay. So it's it's it's. How how much can we stand? It's it's we will stand it until until there's pushback, uh, and the pushback won't occur until all Alaskans are are in this game. Uh, Brett asked about uh, capturing the monies of out of state workers. You know, people who uh, generate their income. Um, uh, you know, making their living on Alaska resources, non residents. You know, how do we capture that? I mentioned that your flat tax argument. Uh, would encompass part of that. Chuck rebuts that and says that top twenty percent. Um, you know, he said that there that that's going to be a drop in the bucket. I'm sorry, not Chuck, but Charlie. He says that that income tax would hit the outsiders. His understanding was it only be about fifty fifty million dollars. I think your numbers show something different than that, right? I mean, the numbers that you kind of penciled out for a flat tax based on that, it's a significantly larger amount than that. Am I wrong? Well, the 2016 ICER study said that 10 percent, seven to 10 percent, uh, either through a sales tax or an income tax, uh, seven to 10 percent would come from outsiders. Uh, Governor Hammond, uh, in some studies they did way, way back in the day, uh, had had even higher figures. So, uh, if you're trying to raise two billion, let's say through taxes, uh, and uh, uh, you use either a flat tax or a, or a progressive income tax or a sales tax. Ten uh, percent of that's uh, two hundred million. Um, so it's it's a it's a it, 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 it's a function of how big your tax rate is, how much you're trying to raise, um, and and about seven to ten percent of that you will drag along from from outsiders. There isn't a cap, basically, on how much you can raise from outsiders. It will it will rise or fall depending upon your tax rate, uh, along with the the impact on everybody else. The only, again, the only downside I see to this whole thing is kind of the Pollyanna-ish glee that we've taken in saying we think that if we get them this revenue that they'll curtail their spending, uh, which I think has been the biggest challenge thus far is that there's no guarantee of a curtailment. They could get, you know, $2 billion in revenue uh, and just keep moving along. Um, and and I think that's that's most people's concern is you give them more money. You know, they're in a crisis mode right now. They're going to have to make hard decisions because there's no money. If we start relieving that pressure, they'll just go back to their old ways. Now, maybe with a tax that affects them, maybe they'll be more reticent to do it. But you just at this point, we just don't know. There's no the proof is the track record is, is they're just going to keep spending. Well, Michael, they're going to keep spending. They're going to keep spending as long as they can find somebody to tax. And and the PFD is the, is the perfect example of that. They've increased the PFD tax. They've increased the amount they've taken out of the PFD uh, every year since since 2016. That tax is going up, and 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 there's been there's been no stopping it. And there's there's more PFD to go. And as long as 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 the top 20 percent are successful in focusing it just on lower and middle income Alaska families, there's no stopping it. They will continue. To, they will continue to grow. Uh, the PFD tax and continue to use it uh, to fund government, uh, and, and and it won't be government growth. It's going to be covering the government we already have. I mean, I don't think I don't think there's a lot of push now to increase government. I think the push is to fund the government we have, not cut uh, the government any further. Uh, and and we need taxes to do that. So that 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 will continue as long as as as. There's some tax base that you could that you can focus on, and and continue to to, to increase the take from that tax base, and the PFD is a perfect example because it's just coming from one segment of Alaskans, only Alaskans, top 20 percent are being impacted. They're not <clears throat> pushing back. You, the only way we're going to stop this, in my opinion, having watched it for the last 10, 15 years, the only way we're going to stop this is is by getting everybody. Uh, involved in the tax and everybody pushing back and saying, no, we don't want any more. We, we're not willing to pay for any more government. As long as you have one group, particularly the top 20 percent, uh, that, that doesn't have to pay for it, they're not going to care and they're going to continue to just acquiesce to uh, additional 
PFD taxes takes out of lower and middle income Alaska families uh, to continue to fund what essentially for them is free government. Right. Well, let's move on to number three. We've already kind of touched on it a little bit back in number one when we were talking about the new oil price uh, norm. Uh, what's your first pass on this potential effect of the uh, oil price war uh, on uh, on the drop in oil, the Alaska oil development, and everything else? What are we looking at long term, in your opinion? I'm concerned. Um, if we're if we're in the process of resetting the base oil price again, as we did. Uh, in 2014, when we went from $100 oil down to $60, $70 oil, if we're if we're resetting the base again, if the Saudis have made the decision that they're going to monetize their resources, they're not going to be the ones holding the the stranded asset bag at the end of the day. Uh, they're going to monetize their resources while there's still a, a, a strong demand for oil. Uh, if if we're resetting that base, Alaska prospects, though they're good, uh, though we have good rocks, they're expensive. To, to develop, and they need a decent oil price. We've sort of survived the transition from $100 oil to $60 oil by, by significantly reducing the cost uh, of Alaska production. We've, we've largely taken it out of the supply chain uh, that supports Alaska production. We've seen that, in, we've seen that impact in oil field supply services to, uh, to Alaska producers. Um, I, I'm not sure that we've got that in us again to be able to wring more costs out to get us from $60 oil down to 40 to $50 oil. I'm not sure the, that we can take enough additional costs out of the supply chain to continue to make Alaska prospects uh, 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 profitable economic uh, at that lower price level. We, we've got a ways to go. Nobody's canceling their projects tomorrow. Nobody's ramping back investment tomorrow. But we've got some huge investments that have to be made uh, over the next uh, uh, few years. Uh, uh, the PICA development, PICA development that Oil Search is doing, Armstrong, Repsol Oil Search is doing, uh, is going to take a heck of a lot of money. Um, and if you follow Oil Search, as I do, they're having a little bit of trouble with their LNG project in, uh, in, in New Guinea right now, which is, which is part of what generates the sort of them the ability to is going to have to be looking at its capital um, and at its various locations in the world to see if Alaska makes sense. If we're moving to an era of $40 to $50 oil, if we're resetting the base um, again uh, as part of this process, uh, is, we're going to be very challenged uh, with Alaska pro projects. Right. We won't see it today. We won't see it today. We won't see it in the next three months as we sort of figure out where we're going with all this. But we may start seeing it after that. And so people who are depending upon long-term oil production, you got to be concerned. Brad Keithley, Alaska's for Sustainable Budgets. Brad, thank you so much for coming on board. As always, we appreciate your thoughts on this. Michael, it's, uh, we're going into a tough era. I appreciate, yeah. uh, I appreciate the opportunity to talk about it. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.